We're going to look at some things. I hope that you will get as excited about them as I did. And in this little story are just wonderful expressions of God's grace and tokens of His favor. And, and we see the extent to which God will go to move heaven and earth in order to accomplish His will. His wise plan includes some unlikely people, some unsuspecting people, and even some very difficult circumstances, but they are all to his glory to further his kingdom. So if you look there at point one, notice, and this is true of your life, your relationships are not accidental. Verse one, and when it was decided that they should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. So a couple of little things there. Notice the, the, the use of the word we. Uh, again, Luke has written this uh, book, and Luke has been faithful, faithful to the Lord, and he's been in and out of the narrative of uh, the, the account in the book of Acts, and now he's in it. Luke had traveled with Paul back to Jerusalem and had been with him throughout this whole ordeal. That's why we have such a detailed account of it. And so Luke is there and others. Notice it says, other prisoners were on their way to Rome. And commentators speculate, but I think it makes sense. These may have been other prisoners who had exercised their right to appeal to Caesar as well. So here we see Paul, though he's completely innocent, now he is identified with this boatload of felons and crooks. I suppose if Paul were alive today, he would be in a boatload of radical conservative pro-lifers, or maybe an extremist who dared to go to the school board meeting and confront the groomer cartel. Remember this, even your innocent Christ, the only innocent man to ever live, was numbered, the Bible tells us, among the transgressors. And remember, he was crucified between two thieves. So don't be surprised when you get defamed or marginalized or if people seek to discriminate against you. It's just the way it has always been. So there we are, Paul on his way to Rome, and, and we're introduced to this person, Julius. And he's part of what's called the Augustan cohort. Now, this is a division of, of Roman soldiers, and he's a centurion, so he is a man's man. He's a leader of men. And he's charged with taking these prisoners 1,400 miles to Rome. So, in the providence of God, I put in your notes, though, Julius will treat the Apostle Paul with considerable regard. Paul, and this will remember the, remember the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph, like Paul, were, they were unjustly imprisoned, and yet God was able to give them favor with their jailers. Now, you can imagine, Julius had never met anybody like the Apostle Paul. I mean, Paul is the anointed apostle to the Gentiles. He's this this incredible genius, and yet he's a very humble servant, even a harmless servant of Christ, much different than the rest of the prisoners. No doubt this had to have made a, a significant imp impression upon Julius. In fact, we see that. Uh, we'll see next week, later on, as, and spoiler alert, the ship's going to sink, so just be aware of that. Later, as the ship is sinking, the Roman soldiers are confronted with a problem. They, upon pain of death, are responsible to get the prisoners to Rome. And if the prisoners escape, it could cost them their lives. So when the ship is starting to break apart, the rest of the soldiers put a plan together. The only way to ensure their own life is by killing all the rest of the prisoners. And in verse 43, it says this, Julius, wishing to save Paul, 
kept his soldiers from killing the prisoners. Isn't that interesting? That's how much favor Paul had with his jailer. Now you can imagine the other side of the equation. Paul was nothing less than a devout Jew. And if you would be uh, and in that situation, a patriot. He loved his nation. He loved his brethren according to the flesh. And you can imagine there was kind of a built-in hostility between the Roman oppressors, especially the military, and the average Jew. But rather than feeling sorry for himself, because he was suffering a gross injustice, Paul trusted that he was exactly where God had ordained him to be. In Philippians 1.13, we read this, And it became known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul's chains then transformed Paul into Christ's chaplain to the imperial guard of the Roman Empire. Can we trust God to enable us to redeem whatever circumstance we are in. In your notes there, Paul embraced his duty then to share the gospel with his persecutors. What about you? Are you able to look past the people that are afflicting you and see their need of Christ and the gospel? See, you're to bring the kingdom of God everywhere you go, regardless of how you got there. Your home is to be an embassy of Christ. Your job is your mission field, and your community is your parish. In this particular situation, Paul's cellmates and his prison guards, he considered virgin territory to plant the seed of the gospel in. Do we see our life from that kingdom perspective? So after his false arrest and beating, and even after a very violent trial before the Sanhedrin, Christ had appeared to Paul. Remember, he was beleaguered, he was harassed, and the word of the Lord came to Paul in a vision. Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also of me in Rome. God had ordained a plan. Paul was leaning into the plan, but in order for the plan to come to fruition, God took this hardened Roman centurion, Julius, and Julius became God's unlikely servant of Paul for the sake of the kingdom of God. God will most certainly fulfill his promises, amen? And Paul most certainly will appear in Rome to preach the gospel, no matter what, shipwreck or otherwise. And God will use Julius to ensure that Paul gets to Rome in fulfillment of Christ's commission. Proverbs 16, verse 17 puts it this way, When a man's ways please the Lord... He even makes his enemies to be at peace with him. And I don't think it's incidental that we get these details. In fact, if we have eyes to see, I think the Lord is speaking to us in them. These are not just filler for the the Bible. They're there for our edification. Other than the name of the centurion Julius, we don't know much. But when you think about it, How important is that name? Remember, Julius is associated with probably the most prominent family of Rome. The kingdom of God is coming, and it's shaking everything up. It's shaking that pagan Roman empire down to its core, even to its most prominent families. Some of you, I've referenced the Aeneid, which is the founding myth of Rome. You should read it. It's amazing literature. But in it, 
there's a family named Julus, J-U-L-U-S, and they claim to be the descendant of Aeneas. Who is Aeneas? Aeneas was the Trojan prince who escaped the, the destruction of Troy, and he led a party of Trojans to exile in Italy, and they became the founders of the Roman Empire. And according to myth, Aeneas's father was mortal, but his mother was a goddess, Venus. So any descendant of Aeneas was a descendant of the gods. Now, we know that's mythological, but Caesar, Julius Caesar, sound familiar? Caesar's family claimed to be the descendant of Aeneas and therefore the descendant of Venus. And of course, Gaius Julius Caesar will become the most notable member of that family, and he will become the great uh, dictator, if you will, of the Roman Republic, and was eventually worshipped as a demigod. And so, we see here, I don't think it's an accident that the word Julius, or the name Julius is the person that's helping. Why? The foundations of the Roman world, the pagan gods and the patristic families are all crumbling before Christ, the true son of the living God. And we see these tokens of it here. We could go back, remember earlier when we looked at the very first convert, non-Jewish convert to Christianity. And who was it? Another Roman centurion. His name was Cornelius, and we went back and we traced the history of that. The Cornelius family was, again, one of the founding families, one of the great pillars of the Roman Empire. And so God is in the business now of coming after and taking over the Roman Empire. And this pagan nation and its prominent families and all of its gods will fall before our Christ. Psalm 22, verse 27, gives us this great promise. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. And we're starting to see it. There's also some irony in, in this story. And again, God, the Bible is such great literature. I don't know how anybody can get bored reading the Bible. But uh, centuries earlier, Moses predicted something. Moses predicted that ships would come from Italy to afflict the Hebrews. We see this in Numbers 24, 24. But the ships shall come from Kittim and shall afflict Asher and Eber, and he too shall come to utter destruction. Kittim is Italy, if you do the, the study there. And Asher and Eber, that's referring to the Jews, to the Israelites. And there's a prophecy that this would happen, that ships would come from Italy to Jerusalem and to, to Israel and destroy them. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. And then at this, basically the same time that that's happening, the ships of conquest are going out from Rome to dominate Israel. Very poetically, what does God do? He sends this little, unknown, obscure Hebrew scholar traveling by ship to the heart of paganism, to the heart of a pagan, chaotic culture. Does that film sound familiar today? And he comes with a simple thing. He comes proclaiming the kingdom of God with a very subversive message. Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord. Be encouraged, saints. He was way outnumbered, much more than we are. Soon Jesus will utterly displace this pagan empire with a holy Roman empire. And it will be established by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of of the martyr's testimony. Those are our weapons. Jean-Paul 
has one of my favorite quotes speaking of this. The life of Christ concerns Him who, being the holiest among the mighty and the mightiest among the holy, lifted with His pierced hands empires off their hinges and turned the stream of centuries out of its channels and still governs the ages. Is that the Christ that you serve today, who is seated at God's right hand? Be of good hope and cheer here today, dear ones. We serve a victorious Christ. Can we go on to verse 2? And embarking in a ship then of Andrematium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coasts of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. Remember, none of this is arbitrary. They set sail in a ship out of Andromatium. I may, not be, I may be slaughtering that. But this is an interesting city. Do you know what this city is most famous for? This is the city that created the modern economy that we're in. Did you know that? They're the first ones to coin gold and silver coins. They're the Bitcoin of the old economy, of the new economy, right? Tokens of gold. So this city was famous. I'm, I'm sure this was probably a beautiful ship. And so they get into this ship, and there's someone else there along with them. This gentleman by the name of Aristarchus. We looked at him because he was singled out in a list earlier of faithful men who did not back off because it was difficult serving the Lord. He was part of that apostolic church planting team that accompanied Paul as he was going around preaching the gospel. Remember when the riot broke out in Ephesus after Paul was uh, preaching the gospel? It was Aristarchus that was drugged into the theater, and he was almost torn limb from limb for the sake of the gospel. But God, in his grace, preserved his life. Well, did Aristarchus say, oh, wow, being a Christian is too hard? I'm not going to do that? No. He was willing then to be one of the faithful men who accompanied the Apostle Paul in planting all of the churches that eventually became the basis of Christendom in which we live in the fruit of. He courageously continued to risk his life. In fact, Paul gives him high praise in a couple of his letters. Paul speaks of Aristarchus as his fellow prisoner. He speaks of Aristarchus as his fellow laborer. And with Luke, Aristarchus came back with Paul into Jerusalem uh, through all of this tumult, through all of these trials. And now it's time for Paul to move on, and who's standing right at his side? Aristarchus. He's been there that whole time. By the way, the only way for a prisoner to have someone travel with him, because he was a Roman citizen, Aristarchus would have to take the posture of a slave. And he could accompany Paul on those terms. What a brother. What a man of God. We don't know if, if Aristarchus made it all the way to Rome. The historians don't know. But as I said, he's mentioned in Colossians. He's mentioned in Philemon as fellow prisoner and fellow laborer. But what else do we know? According to tradition, Aristarchus died in Rome under Nero. So not only was he Paul's fellow prisoner and fellow laborer, he died in Rome as Paul's glorious fellow martyr. Praise God for faithful men of God. We need it in our day. Verse 3, then the next day we put off and in Sidon. So they went up the coast and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. So 
70 miles up the coast was Caesarea. From, uh, from Caesarea was Sidon. And what do we know about Sidon? Sidon was a very notorious Phoenician city. Sidon was the birthplace of Jezebel. Ooh. She was that fanatical Baal worshiper who persecuted Elijah. Remember that story. But ultimately was thrown down from her window and trampled on. Remember in the earthly ministry of Christ when he was preaching in Israel, he was preaching in some of the cities and they were getting frisky. They didn't like what Christ was saying. And what did the scriptures teach us? He departed and went to Sidon. A Phoenician city. What? I thought Christ came for the Jews. And remember it was there that there was that per persistent Syrophoenician widow who, who kept entreating Christ and eventually by the word of Christ her demon-possessed daughter was delivered. I think that was symbolic, don't you? Christ is coming, the kingdom is coming, the demons will flee, Jezebel will be thrown down, and the kingdom of God will be established. And what do we see here as Paul is going up the coast? Apparently, there's a church in Sidon because there's friends there. And Julius grants Paul freedom then to go and hang out at the church potluck. Now remember, how long had he been in jail? For two years. We don't know what physical condition the Apostle Paul was in at that time, but it's interesting how the text seems to, to indicate that Julius had pity on Paul and realized that there was some relief available to him and allowed Paul liberty. What did Paul decided not to come back. Julius, can you see the favor that God is giving uh, Paul through Julius? Julius put his life on the line to let Paul have the liberty to leave to go be ministered to by fellow Christians. And Paul comes back. Paul could have fled. What would you have done if it was your life? Paul was on a mission. He knew that God had sent him to Rome. Probably not the way he imagined it. He wasn't on a Disney cruise, was he? No, he was in a, a ship full of felons and murderers and thieves. And yet, he was resolved. He was resolved to do the will of God no matter the cost. What about you? What about you? What about me? Are we in this to the end, no matter what? That brings me to my second point. There is difficulty in your journey. Verses 4 through 8, it's very fascinating. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, and underline this, because the winds were against us. Is that feel like your life sometime? And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Sicilia and to Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. And notice, and we sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty at Sindias. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmoni, coasting along it with difficulty. We came to the place called Fair Havens, which was near the city of Lycia. You see all those descriptions of the journey? The Christian journey is not always easy. My dear ones, I don't know when you got saved if they told you that. And the difficulty is part of the plan because God loves you. The headwinds were against them. It seemed slow and tedious and difficult. 
there's kind of a, a lie that we maybe try to tell ourselves that, hey, if, if we're just doing the will of God, everything's going to be easy. Everything's going to be simple. And let me tell you that. Just because you're doing what God calls you to do does not exempt you from the hardship and the difficulty of the journey. Headwinds and hard providences are part of God's wise, sanctifying program for your life. And this is true. By the way, this is what separates true Christians from the fake ones. When things are going utterly against you, will you still serve Him? When your heart is broken, when your dreams are dashed, will you still serve Him? As good Christian sailors then, you must learn to do what you can do as opposed to maybe what you would like to do. Even when it gets a little bit tedious and wearisome and mundane. So regardless of our unfavorable circumstances down here, though, the way we can persevere is by always keeping our eye on our destination. By God's grace, where have we been called to? We're called to Him. We're called to be with Christ. And we're going to make steady progress towards that, no matter what the cost. Then interestingly enough, there pops up in this story, so after all this difficulty, oh, it's so hard, and finally they make it to a place called Fair Havens. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Oh, we made it. We made it to Fair Havens. What a beautiful place. What a great place to, to hang out and to rest and recuperate. Or was it? It wasn't. In fact, uh, Matthew Henry reminds us, it was not the harbor they were bound for. They were on their way to Rome. It was a fair haven, but it was not their haven. No matter how pleasant your circumstances might be right now, how much you feel like you're at home in fair haven, you are never to feel perfectly at home here, church. Our home is with Christ, ultimately. If you're really comfortable down here, that's a little bit of a, a wake-up call for you. There should always be a lively hope of heaven in your heart that renders a sanctified sense of discontentment down here because this is not heaven it never will be. We are, according to the Scriptures, to keep that lively hope kindled in our hearts. Notice what verse 12 does. It describes the fair haven. The harbor was not suitable to spend winter in. Hmm. Fair havens may seem wonderful for a time, but when the real storm shows up, when the winter storms come, are you really where you want to be? See, you must be willing to part from any earthly fair haven in pursuit of the kingdom of God because any fair haven that God has not sent to you is not safe for you. You must seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and go there, whether you want to go or not, because that's where you're safe. That's where you're with Christ. Seek first His kingdom, not fair havens. So let me ask you, dear ones, where can you do the most good for the kingdom of God? That should always be the very first question you ask yourself when making decisions. Lord, how does this fit into your larger plan? How does this make sense in building the kingdom of God? To be out of that place puts you in spiritual danger. In fact, there's commonly more spiritual danger in the easy places, right? Because then we get a little tempted, don't we? Paul was willing to go to Rome. 
even if that meant facing his own death. Ultimately, it did. He died in Rome for his faith. Are you sailing the right way? Are you willing to take the hard journey towards your ultimate home, which is in heaven, and go through wherever God has called you to go through and to live and to do and to be whatever God has called you to be in this life in pursuit of that ultimate goal. We're all called to it. And by the way, you'll be miserable outside of it. But yeah, serving the Lord is hard sometimes, but it's exciting. And stepping out in faith and doing things that you know are the will of God, even though there may be some difficulty in it, you will be miserable anywhere else because you're called to something much higher. And you know it, and we all know it in our hearts. And then thirdly, jilted advice does not justify abandonment. Kind of an interesting idea. Let's look at this. So, verse 9, so much, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was over, Paul advised them saying, sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. So what's happening here? They've been out at sea longer than they expected. Remember, it, all of the things that had slowed them down, and now it had gotten to that very dangerous time of the year for them to be out on the sea. The fast, by the way, refers to the annual Day of Atonement. And by the way, what day was it that year? September 24th. What's today? The 24th. I thought that was kind of ironic or poetic. So that had passed. And so Paul gives his advice to Julius, and then there's the owner of the ship and the pilot of the ship. And he says, sir, I perceive. It's just the very simple word, I see. I'm making a, a, giving you my best advice. So Paul is speaking from the standpoint of informed godly wisdom. Uh, he's not saying, thus saith the Lord at this point. There's no sense that this is a prophetic revelation. He didn't have a dream at this point. He will in the next, we'll see uh, next week. But Paul was just giving them uh, maybe a, a little bit of pious advice. Hey, uh, guys, this is not the time we need to be going out to see. Now, why would we want to listen to Paul? Well, in 2 Corinthians 11, three times I was shipwrecked. Night and a day I was, I was adrift at sea. So the Apostle Paul had some experience around shipwrecks, and he's looking at this boat, and he knew it was doomed. Now, I don't know what Paul was seeing. Maybe the greedy ship owner had overladen the ship, so it's riding pretty low in the water. Now we're going to get out into the seas at the worst possible time. Maybe he saw something that he thought compromised the integrity of the ship. We're not told, but we are told he's ignored. Verse 11, but the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So the owner, looking at the situation, decides that he needs to move the ship. Now, let me ask you, do you think the owner was uh, not interested in his own financial gain at this point? And then the pilot, wanting to keep his job, right? Is he going to disagree with the owner of the boat and say, oh, no, you're wrong? Uh, no. So he, he, sure, yeah, fine. So this guy with a, a great financial interest and his employee uh, make a decision. Financial conflicts never can cloud our judgment, can they? Financial implications. And so what does Julius do? He ignores Paul. And he takes the advice of the experts. 
Are you with me? Are you tracking? And by doing that, put their life basically in, their own, in the owner's hands. And by the way, it goes on to say that the majority voted to go along with the experts. And what happened? It ends in a shipwreck. Sometimes you're going to see the disasters coming, maybe just from common sense or maybe because the Holy Spirit's uh, quickening something in you, and you will warn people, you will cajole people, you'll beg them to do what is right, and yet you still end up with gender groomers throwing rainbow glitter into the minds of our kids in the libraries and the public schools. Sometimes a disaster comes, and then you are cajoled by the experts not to kill grandma, wear a mask, take a vax, and if you survive the vax, we later find out that we still were not immune from COVID, and we could still transmit it. Hmm. Listening to the experts, listening to people with financial self-interest. So what do you do? Well, you can't just get mad and say, I told you so. Oh, yes, you can. So here's the gift you've been waiting for your whole life. Do I ever get to tell somebody, I told you so? Yes, you can. And here's your verse, because we'll look at this next week in verse 21. When everything fell apart, what did Paul say to the people as the ship is being destroyed? Men, you should have listened to me. So underline that in your Bible, but you can't just get mad. You can't just say, I told you so. You can't say it, but then you must be constructive. You must make a plan with God's help to be helpful and to do what you can and to help even the people to took, that took the bad advice, and that's what we will see happens next week. In fact, God will show up and give Paul a vision and be very helpful. So why must we do that? Why must we make a rescue plan for all of those people who ignored good advice, ignored what they should have done? Because guess what? God made a rescue plan for you. Because apart from the grace of God, we ignored everything God has said to us, right? We suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. We did not do what we knew in our heart to be right and true, and yet God in His great mercy rescued us. 1 Corinthians 5.19 says this, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And though you ignored God's truth, and are without excuse, and, and deserve God's wrath, God made a plan. On the cross, Christ, the only innocent man, the only one who never knew sin, became sin, became a sin offering in your place. Then God, through the finished work of our Christ, accomplished on the cross and, and testified by His resurrection from the dead, extends good news to you, mercy and forgiveness. The good news is today, we can still have hope. That is, if we will repent and turn to Christ and be saved, God is merciful. He's a rescuing God. And so I implore you today, on behalf of Christ, to trust in Him and the promise of God is he will mercifully rescue you, will you? Let's pray.